Well, welcome everyone to church this morning and to the word. Welcome, Anna. Seb. How's the puppy? Good. We're going to uh, open in prayer for the message, so let's bow our heads and pray together. Thank you, Father, for today, and we thank you for your word. We love your word. We love that you have given us the scriptures, and today we want to learn from it. So we open our hearts to you, and we ask that you would speak to us. You challenge us. You would grow us, and you'd help us to, uh, to really kind of lean in to what you're wanting to say to us this morning uh, in this message Are we there yet? So thank you, Father, for being here in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. I'd like to invite up Coretta, and she's going to start by sharing the word with us today from uh, from Joshua chapter 9. So thank you, Coretta. The deceit of the Gibeonites. Now all the kings west of the Jordan River heard about what had happened. These were the kings of the Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, who lived in the hill country in the western foothills and along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea as far north as the Lebanon mountains. These kings combined their armies to fight as one against Joshua and the Israelites. But when the people of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and I, they resorted to deception to save themselves. They sent ambassadors to Joshua, loading their donkeys with weathered saddlebags and old patched wineskins. They put on worn out sand patched sandals and ragged clothes, and the bread they took with them was dry and moldy. When they arrived at the camp of Israel at Gilgal, they told Joshua and the men of Israel, we have come from a distant land to ask you to make a peace treaty with us. The Israelites replied to these Hevites, how do we know you don't live nearby? For if you do, we cannot make a treaty with you. They replied, we are your servants, but who are you? Joshua demanded, where do you come from? They answered, your servants have come from a very distant country. We have heard of the might of the Lord your God and all he did in Egypt. We have also heard what he did to the two Amorite kings east of the Jordan River, King Sihon of Heshbon and King Og of Bashan, who lived in Ashtaroth. So our elders and all our people instructed us, take supplies for a long journey. Go meet with the people of Israel and tell them, we are your servants, please make a treaty with us. This bread was hot from the ovens when we left our homes, but now, as you can see, it is dry and moldy. These wineskins were new when we filled them, but now they are old and split open, and our clothing and sandals are worn out from our very long journey. So the Israelites examined their food, but they did not consult the Lord. Then Joshua made a peace treaty with them and guaranteed their safety, and the leaders of the community ratified their agreement with a binding oath. Three days after making the treaty, they learned that these people actually lived nearby. The Israelites set out at once to investigate and reached their towns in three days. The names of these towns were Gibeon, Kephira, Beroth, and Kiriath Jerim. But the Israelites did not attack the towns, for the Israelite leaders had made a vow to them in the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. The people of Israel grumbled against their leaders because of the treaty. But the leaders replied, since we have sworn an oath in the presence of the Lord, the God of Israel, we cannot touch them. This is what we must do. We must let them live, for divine anger would come upon us if we broke our oath. Let them live. So they made them wood cutters and water carriers for the entire community, as the Israelite leaders directed. Joshua called together the Gibeonites and said, Why did you lie to us? Why did you say that you live in a distant land 
when you live right here among us. May you be cursed. From now on, you will always be servants who cut wood and carry water for the house of my God. They replied, we did it because we, your servants, were clearly told that the Lord your God commanded his servant Moses to give you this entire land and to destroy all the people living in it. So we feared greatly for our lives because of you. That is why we have done this. Now we are at your mercy. Do to us whatever you think is right. So Joshua did not allow the people of Israel to kill them. But that day he made the Gibeonites the woodcutters and water carriers for the community of Israel and for the altar of the Lord, wherever the Lord would choose to build it. And that is what they do to this day. That's the word of the Lord. Thank you, Coretta. So we've got Joshua chapter 9 and this kind of weird story about the people of Gibeon, the Gibeonites. And so Coretta shared the story, but basically what happened was that these people from Gibeon, they'd heard about the Lord, they'd seen what had been happening to their neighbours, and they were in awe, they were scared, and so they come up with this deception. They put on old clothes, broken shoes, and they filled their bags with old food, like they'd been on a journey from a distant land. And when uh, they approached the Israelites, uh, Joshua, they said, we want a treaty, we're of no threat to you, and the Israelites agreed. Have you ever felt like you were on the wrong side? Have you ever kind of, maybe it was the wrong football team or netball team or just the wrong side of an argument? I remember, um, I remember when I was in year seven and I grew up in an area in Adelaide called Fulham. Lots of market gardens. Uh, my family were German and we, uh, we had market gardens in my great-grandpa and my grandfather. But there was lots of people that were German, Italian, Greek. Most of my friends were called uh, Tony or Pasquale. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, people from that part of the world, well, we're all a bit fiery. And I remember I went to this birthday party one day at my friend's place and we decided while we were waiting for the food to cook, we'd go around the corner to the local playground. But there was a problem. A gang owned it. By a gang, I mean a group of six uh, kind of to ten-year-olds. <laughs> Vicious. And, uh, and we went there and... And we decided to play on, on the swings and they kind of pulled up to us and said, this is our playground. You can't be here. You've got to get going. And, and my friend, well, he didn't like that. It was his birthday. He had all his friends around. I think he was feeling a bit extra confident. And so he kind of fronted up. And next thing, there was a fight. And I'm, we were sitting back like these guys are rolling on the ground, pulling each other's hair and kind of, you know, giving each other a thump and... And my friend won. <laughs> so I felt, we felt pretty good about that. So then, uh, and the other guy, he, he ran off. But what we didn't know is he lived next door. <laughs> and his dad wasn't six. <laughs> I still remember his dad now. It's got the khaki shorts, the long socks up to the knees. Uh, kind of quite a kind of stocky kind of market gardener type. And uh, he got in his car and started chasing us through the streets. And, uh, and because I looked like my friend, we were both had blonde hair. We stood out in that area, as you can imagine, amongst the Pasquales and the Tonys. And uh, I was a bit slower than my friend with the running, so the guy's driving through the streets, kind of pulls up, and I'm the last one, like... <laughs> 
and he kind of grabs me by the arm. He's like, yo, I beat up my son, you know. I'm like, oh, it wasn't me. Yeah, so anyway, I kind of realized at that point that I thought I was on the right side, but I was actually on the wrong side. I was scared for my life. Has anyone ever been chased through the streets? By a man in khaki shorts. A bit like Roger. He kind of looked a bit like you, but a bit more rotund. It's a bit scary. I knew I didn't have a hope. So I think that's what the Gibeonites were kind of feeling. They're seeing all this stuff go down and they're actually really, really scared for their lives. They know that they haven't got a hope. You know, like when it's half time and you've scored one goal and the rest of the team, they're just, they're up 20, 20 goals over you and you just know, I want to be on that team. I think it's more complex than that too, though. Because I think something else was going on. I was trying to work out how to describe it, but I remember this story of me in primary school again. This time I'm like year seven. I'm, uh, I've prepared all term for our end of year performance. I wasn't really a sporty guy, but creative stuff was important to me. I'd, I'd memorise my lines. I, I, I used to love to sing and uh, kind of got my voice all ready. And uh, we've got this end of year uh, school kind of play. We get in the car. We, we've, we've all, we're all ready to go. We drive there. The family gets out. But my dad, well, he was very passionate about reading the paper. I don't know. I don't know if you've, been, you've got dads that love the paper. Nowadays, there's not... Like, is there papers still? I don't, I don't know. Maybe. Maybe you can get a paper somewhere. But anyway, the back, back in the old days, kids. Okay, kids. Back when I was young, there was these things called papers. <laughs> People would read them every day. It's kind of like instead of swiping down, you swipe the cross. It's like just... <laughs> It was the real thing. And uh, anyway, my dad used to love that for some reason and he would read it. And uh, in this particular day, he, in, instead of coming into my drama performance, he decided that it was going to be much more enthralling to stay in the car in the car park and read the paper. And I didn't really mind that to start with. I kind of felt like, okay, all right, well, that's, that's fine, Dad. I kind of you do you. Uh, but I just, I do remember being on the stage and um, looking out at all the dads there, you know, with their kind of film cameras, you know, you know, taking photos of their, their kids and, well, my dad wasn't there. And at the end, I remember getting off the stage and uh, the dads were coming up to the other kids and I was just thinking, it wasn't like, it wasn't like a... I didn't want him to be my dad anymore. It was just that I kind of realised that I was kind of missing out. It's just I kind of felt like the, the stuff I saw going on between them and their dads, I wasn't experiencing that and I wanted it. Like I, there was a yearning in my heart for that. I think the Gibeonites felt that too. I don't think it was just about them recognising that there was risk and danger and that they were on the wrong side of a bad situation. But I think, I think that they saw the way that the God of Israel looked after them. They could see it. They could see that this God was real and that he cared and he loved them. I think they wanted that. I think there was something in them that yearned for that. And they wanted to, they felt like outsiders from God and I think they were hungry for it. And so they, 
they kind of find themselves in this situation where they've got three options. They could fight, they could flee, or they could appeal for friendship. They could rumble, they could run, or they could reconcile. They could tussle, they could turn, or they could seek treaty. And so they sought a treaty. Now we know that they kind of did this thing a bit tricky, where they were deceptive, but I think that their goal wasn't deception. Their goal was treaty. I don't think that they were trying to necessarily... They were trying to deceive, but I don't think that was what they were after. They just wanted to reconcile. They were seeking friendship... And they went about it the way that they thought they would have the best chance for that. What would you do? What's your tendency to fight, to take a step back and flee, or to face the risk of rejection? but take a step towards God. And I think deep down the Gibeonites' attitude in their heart, I think it was actually right. I think they were on the right page. Because... They weren't dishonest about, well, their only deception was how they came, not why they came. They were deceptive about who they were, but not what they wanted. That they were truly honest about. And we can see that their attitude was right because of how they reacted when they were given a lowly job. Right? They they were embraced, they were given treaty, but then they were found out and Joshua said to them, okay guys, you're in, but you have to be woodcutters and water carriers. That's your job. And they said, fine. We are your servants. Do with us as you will. Uh, I'll read out Joshua chapter 9, 24. They replied, this is Joshua asking them, why did you deceive us? They replied, we did it because we, your servants, were clearly told that the Lord your God commanded his servants Moses to give you this entire land and to destroy all the people living in it. So we feared greatly for our lives because of you. That is why we have done this. Now we are at your mercy. Do to us whatever you think is right. That's amazing. Their heart of trust their heart of surrender, it's like, what, whatever you want. If you want us to carry water, if you want us to carry wood, so be it. It's like, can you get a glimpse of their attitude? If they were in it for the wrong reason, their attitude would have been quite different. How do you know if you have come to God the right way? 
when you're offered something you feel is beneath you. If you get upset, it shows that maybe, maybe the way you came to God isn't quite right. I remember my first youth camp that I went to. When I, was a, when I was a teenager, I was 12 years old, and I remember the worship and just being so impacted by God at that time. Who here has been to a youth camp? It's just, it was impactive. And there's these other young people, and they're on fire for God, and they, they're preaching words about, um, about uh, you know, following him with your heart and your life. And I just remember just being overwhelmed with this desire that I wanted to I wanted to do that. I wanted to live my life for God. And I remember getting down on my knees and just promising that to God. God, here it is. Like, here's my life. Do with it as you will. Mold me. Make me. I recognize that I am not. I've got these problems in my life. And I, but, and I, I can't do what you want me to do unless you do some molding. So God, I give you permission to make me into the person that you want me to be. Has anyone ever prayed that prayer? It's, uh... And then I remember like years later, going through all the struggles that I've been through. There, there was issues in my marriage. I found it really tough to be a father. I struggled with some mental health things. And just life through some difficult situations at me. And I can remember kind of crying out to God one day and saying, God, like, why are you pulling me from one side to the other? I just feel like I'm being smashed and crushed. And, and it's just, uh, it's not fair. It's not right. It's too hard. I remember praying this in my bedroom, in the quiet. And God reminded me of that moment when I was at youth. And he said, well, I'm only doing what you asked. You asked me to to make you into the person that that I want you to be, and, and I'm and I'm doing it, and, and it wasn't said in cruelty. It wasn't said in a in a sense of stop your whinging, but it was a sen- said in a way just to to open my eyes and understand that that God doesn't well he he allows us to participate and I'd in a sense given him permission and he was only really doing what was in my heart for him to do. It just was a lot harder than I thought. It just was a lot more uncomfortable and he took me to places I didn't really want to go to get me to where I wanted to go, if you know what I mean. Has anyone ever felt that? It's like, man, this is harder than I thought. That's what these Gibeonites, that's their attitude in this scene. They're saying, here I am. Here I am. We know you're God's people and we want in. And if it means carrying wood and if it means carrying water, well, here we are. You do with us what you think is right. It's a powerful statement. Powerful statement. <clears throat> it's not really much different than uh, things we see King David wrote in Psalms. Have a look at Psalms 84. It's going to be on the screen. King David says this, A single day in your courts is better than a thousand anywhere else. I would rather be a gatekeeper in the house of my God than live the good life in the home of the wicked. Give me a lowly job if it's for God. Give me a gatekeeper job if it's for you. 
Being close to you is worth more than anything. Doing what you want me to do is worth more than anything else. So fire away, God, I trust you. It's an amazing attitude. Not only we see this in David, we can't really talk any more about this attitude before the most obvious person that just this just this attitude just kind of exploded out of him everywhere he went. It flowed like a like a living stream, and that is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's like he, he's, he's God himself, he's in heaven, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and he says to the Father, place on me humanity. I'm going to go down to the earth. I'm going to walk among them to be your servant. He said, give me a lowly job. And he, he does it. He comes to earth he places on humanity, but then he places on our sin. He puts on our shame and he carries it. We see this really comes to a, a real point in the Garden of Gethsemane where he prays a prayer similar to David. He says, Father... If you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. This is such a beautiful attitude. And this attitude is so attractive to God, what the Gibeonites did. It's so attractive to God what David did because it's like him. It's, God isn't like this big, heavy, hard kind of dude where, where he's the boss and, and we're the sorry people. I don't know if you've seen that YouTube video. It's, it's one of my favourites of the kid that wants chips. He wants nuggets. Bacon. I want my bacon. <laughs> and it's the mum swap, the mum swap show. You know, and and the new mum won't let him have his bacon because, well, it's not very healthy. <laughs> and he's getting really cross at this at this new mum. He's like, oh, I want my bacon. You you know. You think you're the boss and we're the sorry people. That's what he says. You see, that's not what God's like. Sometimes we have this, this vision of God who, who's like dictating terms. And what really makes him happy is if we kneel to it, right? But that's, that's not really what's going on at all, right? He, he's attracted to it, not because of, of the submissive nature of it, but because that's what he's like. It's like when we do that, we're like him. We, we see it in the nature of Christ. That he humbles himself. The God who put the stars in place, who controls the wind and the storms, humbles himself for our sake. And when we humble ourselves, it's like we're like him. He loves it. It's it just so and so there's this problem of of the distance between the Gibeonites and God. There's this issue of of their outsiders, but this problem is solved by a couple of things. It solves the problem of being on the wrong side. And there's two things that the Gibeonites did. Firstly, they had this desire. They had this recognition that God was God. That this dude that the Israelites have got, he's powerful. 
his creator, he's on their side, he's, they believed in him. It's like they knew. They had this belief that this thing was not some kind of made-up story. It wasn't witchcraft, hocus-pocus or a magic trick. This stuff was real. There's, there's a God there. and He's the God of gods and he's the Lord of lords and he's the King of kings. And they believed in him. But then they had this, this other side of it. This other part of the, of the equation, and that was that they were stuck. It's like they knew their place. They knew they were in trouble. And so they had these two things. They had this belief that they knew that there was a God and that he was with them and that they weren't and they were in trouble and they were really stuck. We can call it... Faith. They had faith. They believed God. And they had humility. They knew they weren't God. But the thing they did is it's like they they held both of those things at the same time. This faith and this humility. They held it at the same time. And that is the essence of salvation. When we can hold our faith in God and our humility that we aren't at the same time, there is always, 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 always reconciliation with God. We go from being outsiders, we go from being onlookers to being adopted. Every single time. We notice this uh, just in a, a few chapters before with Rahab. This is, uh, did Tash speak on Rahab or not? I'm not sure. The, 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 uh, the walls of Jericho, because I was away that week. I had a little bit of a cold. But we've got this situation where Jericho is is a city, walled, and Rahab had the same attitude. She knew that God was coming. She knew she was in trouble. She had faith and she had humility. We see it here in uh, Joshua 2. No wonder our hearts have melted. And have fear. No one has the courage to fight after hearing such things. For the Lord, your God, is the supreme God of the heavens above and the earth below. Now swear to me by the Lord that you will be kind to me and my family, since I have helped you. Give me some guarantee. We know that she made a deal with the Israelites and she became part of their people. She became one with them. She was a part of Jericho. She came out of that and into God's family. And then we've got this story with the Gibeonites. And then if we turn a few pages over, uh, one generation later, we see it again with Ruth. I don't know if you know the story of Naomi and Ruth. Uh, we've got a little bit up on the, on the screen. Ruth 1 uh, verse 16. But Ruth replied, Don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. She said this to Naomi. She was from Moab. She had no business being part of the people of God. But she was with Naomi, who was, who was an Israelite. She'd, she'd come from an area near Jerusalem. And she decided that she's going to kind of head back. And Ruth did, had no, she had no uh, natural reason to go back, but she, she wanted to be there. There was something in her spirit that she, she saw God and she said, I'm going to leave all of this behind. 
I'm going to go with you, Naomi, and you, your God is going to be my God. And she was welcomed in to the community. She came out of Moab and was adopted into God's family. Reuben uh, Wilson is going to come and share his testimony. And I want you to notice that he got to a point where he realised he needed to pick sides and take a step closer to God. So thank you, Reuben. Church. Yeah, so if you don't know me, my name is Reuben. And uh, most people just call me handsome, but... No, I'm kidding. But um, yeah, today I'm going to be sharing my story. And um, yeah, it's been a bit of a journey. But um, yeah, I grew up in a family of five, a Christian family. And, um, you know, I had the best parents growing up. Like, you know, they were just the best role models. They just loved me so much. I had like two older sisters that only picked on me most of the time. But um, yeah, I came to Life House when I was like really young. Um, yeah, back when Ray Betcher was actually preaching, so getting pretty old now. But um, yeah, as a teenager, I didn't really like following rules, um, as most teenagers do. But um, I only saw faith and like Christianity as a set of rules, really. I didn't really connect it with the relationship with God. And um, yeah, I didn't really like following my parents' rules. I didn't really understand why they were setting boundaries up for me. And... Um, at age 17, I moved up to Adelaide for an apprenticeship with, for work. And um, I moved in with my best mate. Um, yeah, and we, you know, it was awesome. Like, he's my mate since, you know, birth. We've been mates for like 19 years or whatever. And um, yeah, moving away kind of separated me from church. Like, I stopped going. I couldn't be bothered going. I, I had better things to do, to be honest. And um, yeah, like, no one was making me come to church anymore. And um, the environment that I was in kind of influenced me to, I guess, like, just turn away from God. And, um, you know, we started going to parties, just drinking all the time, started doing drugs and all that. And um, it gradually got darker and darker. And um, I got off, I was off for work for a couple months because I was injured. I had no money. I was so broke. And um, so I started selling drugs. I started putting myself in situations where I was, you know, people were holding knives to me and just like really dangerous people and I, I just realised that God was putting it on my heart that this wasn't the life that he called me to live. One day my sister invited me to Lifehouse here for a baby dedication that Mark was doing actually and um, yeah, I don't know, that left such an impression on me because I hadn't been to church for years and um, yeah, I don't know, I just, it just really impressed on my heart that day and um, there's a saying going around, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. And this really made me think about what future I wanted to take and what path I wanted to choose. Um, my mates started questioning me, oh, so you're going to church now? Like, what's with that? Like, you know, you're starting to, like, read your Bible, you're, like, you're changing. And um, it got worse and worse and eventually he didn't talk to me for, like, weeks or, and he couldn't even bear to look at me anymore. He couldn't be around me. And um, one day he just left a note on my bedside table saying, pretty much Christians are the worst type of people on earth. Um, I'm bad for his mental health. Christians don't care about anybody else but themselves. <laughs> and um, yeah, pretty much he gave me the option to decide I'm going to pick him or his, my stupid God that you can't even see. <laughs> and um, yeah, I don't know, this really hurt me. Like no one had hurt me this much before in my life and I was so broken. And I didn't know what to do, so I actually messaged Mark one day and asked for some guidance from him because I was so, I don't know, just hurting inside. And um, Mark really helped me through this situation. And um, the next day I was praying to God, like, you know, just really I need some guidance. Like, I'm going to have to quit my job. I'm going to have to find a new place to live. And I was, just didn't know what to do. Like, I just felt like he really gave me so much peace at that time where... He gave me, like, just gave me faith that if I trust in him, like, I don't know what the future is going to hold, but he's going to carry me through this, even though that I'm not in control anymore. A few weeks after that, someone came to me at church and said, I feel like God's put a verse on my heart for you, and it's Isaiah 30 to 21, 
Whether you turn to the left or to the right, you will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. The truth is, church, I tried all the world had to offer, and all I was left with was a crushed spirit and an empty soul. I felt so hopeless, and I couldn't overcome my depression and my habits on my own, and believe me, I tried. I prayed God would transform me. I had to make the biggest decision of my life, and, he, and so he repositioned me, not to where I wanted to go at the time, but he, rather he took me to the place that I was called to be. Since coming back to Jesus, I've found a love greater than anything else I've experienced, and I'm never going back. Thanks, Ruben. Um, it's just a great example of exactly what we're talking about, the hard attitude that these Gibeonites had, that King David had, that Christ himself, in a sense, had. But the Gibeonites, they, they saw something that they wanted. It was God. And they knew that they needed it. And they held these things together like Reuben. He knew he was stuck. He knew he was in a situation. And he wanted God. And God met him in that place. And uh, God lifted him up. And God's putting him back together. And uh, he's part of a a family. Uh, It even helped reconcile you with your parents in a sense too you know you're closer with them and and that's what God wants for us the beautiful thing is if you follow the story of the Gibbonites kind of what what happened to them uh, it's it's quite beautiful Um, Saul ends up in charge a bit later and and he gets a little bit enthusiastic about the purity of the Israelite race in a sense. But God, and starts to kind of try to genocide them, God defends them. He says, no, not these people. He stops Saul. He reinstates them. Uh, They even place the tabernacle on the the hill of Gibeon, the the main hill in their town. And the people of God, all the people of God, worship God there. Later on, they're included in the Babylon uh, Babylon, uh, assault. They're taken to Babylon with the the Israelites, um, in a sense, suffering alongside of them. And when they're released... Nehemiah calls on them to rebuild the wall alongside the Israelites. We can see that they are not uh, left out of this, but God honours the faith of this community. And it's a beautiful scene because it wasn't just one person like David or like Ruth or like Rahab. The community of Gibeonites got together and God honoured that. And it didn't just affect one or two, but it affected generations. It's, they are now part of God's people because of their faith, their humility, and their standing together. I just think that's a beautiful scene. I think we can learn a lot from that. I think that's what God wants for us, church. He wants a community of people filled with faith and humility. He wants us to stand side by side and, and, and stand up for what we believe in, even in the face of opposition. The Gibeonites, though, came in deception. They came to God, but they, but they didn't really quite think that they'd be accepted if they came as they were. And Rahab, well, she came with bargaining. I'll, I'll, I'll set you free if you promise to let me in. But you see, Ruth, she came as she was. She did not fear walking from Moab right into the centre of town, 
right up close to the temple because she went with Naomi. She had an advocate. She didn't deceive. She didn't bargain. She came as she was. We have an advocate, and it's Christ. I don't know if you've ever thought about that before, but when we come to God, we, we don't need to bargain with Him. When we come to God, we, we don't need to deceive or pretend that we're better or different than we are. We just come as we are. The Gibeonites didn't know. that They, they had that available to them the whole time. They didn't really understand because we know way back with Abraham that the God made a blood oath. That scene where he sacrificed in his son got... And God says, hold your hand, don't, don't kill your son. And he provides a lamb and he, and he makes a promise that, that his people are going to change the world. He was talking of Christ. Paul makes this clear in Galatians that that's what was going on there, that that lamb was, was representing Christ. It was a spiritual promise that all are welcome to come to God through the blood of the lamb. Jesus, don't have to deceive. We can come as we are. So today, we don't need to trick God. Don't need to try to bargain with God. Because we have an advocate, Christ, who made a way. We're going to sing a song now called Cornerstone. And it's a good song. It's like my favourite. And Cornerstone is a beautiful hymn. It talks of our Saviour Christ, the cornerstone who made a way for us. I just want us to stand as a church community. Would you like to stand? I want to sing this together. We've got time to really uh, worship. We've got time to assess our hearts. How do you come to God? Is it is there a bit of fear there? We don't need it. You sometimes feel like you need to justify your place here. You don't need to. God is welcoming us to Him. He's taken every barrier out the way. We're going to reflect on that. Maybe you struggle a bit. With faith, this idea of, of recognising who God is, I encourage you to, to trust God as we sing this song and, and dare to believe that He is who He is. Maybe you struggle with humility. Forget. You forget that there's nothing in you that deserves the blessing that He places. And you struggle and jostle a bit when you're given a job that's beneath you or you feel offended. I just encourage you like Christ to, to cast that off and be like him in the Garden of Eden and just say, do with me what you will. Take off my fear. I recognise what you place on me. So we're going to worship and I just encourage you to do uh, just let God do what He would in your life, to lift your voices to Him, to praise, to pray in Jesus' name. Father, I just pray for this time as we worship You. Father, we ask that you, you would search us, that You would sift us, that You would do a work in us. Father, make us a community. We love that the Gibeonites were unified in that. They were unified in their faith in you and you blessed them. And Father, we pray that you would unify us for our community need us. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Holly.